thanks for the introduction. Thanks also for all of you being here. Um, so as the title suggests, you know, we'll be talking about Ictus forms, which is still missing from that tree since last time, but we can fix that hopefully soon. And we're going to be telling you a bit more about uh, animal emergence. So what I like usually just to do is to start with my talk by reminding everyone if this doesn't work. It doesn't work. So we can do this maybe like this. Everything is frozen. Excellent. Ah, maybe, maybe not. All right, so we start again. So I just like to remind everyone this is about 10 million species estimated to live on this planet. We have genomic information for about 2 million species, mostly from metabarcoding and metagenomics um, data. And all of the mechanistic biology we know today come from a handful of system organisms, which if we place them on the eukaryotic field of life, most of them would fall into three categories, land plants, fungi, and environments, which I'm pretty sure, you know, we'd learn a lot of these species, but as you can imagine, there are two things that we can, we can not answer, right? There's evolutionary transitions, that we cannot answer with any of the model system here because you need to have multiple species at the right position in the tree of life. And the second thing we're missing here is that we cannot understand the global biodiversity because we don't have enough models across the tree of life. So now we're in an evolutionary sub-monkey lab and we're interested in one of these big questions, which is understanding the evolution of animal uh, embryogenesis. And for that, we're trying to establish a specific lineage of produce called Ictus forms to answer one of these questions. And the second thing that we're now pushing through or contributing to, um, which is trying to understand or review functionality of structural diversity using expansion across, which I'll touch about uh, towards the end of my talk. Um, before jumping in, because it's mainly for PhDs and postdocs, I thought, you know, it would be good to just give you an idea of, of, of my uh, career path. So I'm born and raised in Palestine, which is basically the day I need to point where is it on the map. Unfortunately, uh, I moved to uh, Grenoble in 2005 to do a bachelor, master, and I actually already started working in the lab at that time. And I was focused only on uh, E. coli. And I want to emphasize on the organism we've been working with because I think we're moving into a shift in terms of how science needs to be done, at least in my opinion, which is something we can discuss later. So I was working in Italy, um, mainly about understanding how Italy can be higher than all time or a genius, and trying to decide if it's a uh, model of life. Then I moved to uh, the library of Susan McLean, the time of the union, the chat worked on how fishing started with our new season, uh, so needs and programs to get her out. Um, and there, I'm working on two models, uh, two species of species, one is Fondry and one is Japonicus. And then after that, I moved to Barcelona to, with a monetary fellowship and an international ability fellowship to start working on these new similar fall zones, which are these species that are closely related to animals, which I'll tell you more about in a second. And there, I already found exciting one of my species I work with because I believe that comparative approaches across different species is key if you want to get some sort of overall understanding of a specific process. And uh, since 2020, I've been an ambitious fellowship and I moved to BFL. And as you can see, we just, my version of how cell biology needs to be done is not about focusing on a single species, but you need to really, and maybe more than hundreds is a bit too much. We can talk also about this, but for now, this is where we're going. So, as I said, we're going to be talking mainly about animal embryogenesis. And as I'm pretty sure you all know, all animals are pretty distinct. But besides that, they all share a common embryonic developmental program, which starts with the fertilization of a single cell of egg to form a zygote. Then the zygote will undergo um, cleavages to form a multicellular embryo, uh, which causes these cell organisms in space and time. And at one point, these cells will undergo calculation in order to uh, define the future of body plants. Now, so despite all the differences between all the animals here, all of them will undergo some sort of conserved early embryonic developmental program. Now, if we take into account that all animals share a common ancestor, um, then you know, there are two options and such development evolved only in animals, and so that represents an animal innovation, or 
the issue of complete system of the mechanism which are present in their classes. Now, here is the question, right? If you focus only on model systems, if you take Mars and Drosophila, then you will never be able to answer this question, right? The only way you answer this question is to go back in time. So how do you go back in time? Two ways of doing so. One is to look at the fossil record, and the earliest uh, fossil record of an animal dates back to around 700 or 650 million years ago. And, you know, it looks a bit like this, right? There's some sort of embryonic fossils. The problem with this approach is that they're almost inexistent, or right? the number of fossils in that time period is very rare. We are even sure whether they have animals or animal relatives. And of course, fossils are dead, so it's a bit difficult to understand dynamics using fossils. The other approach is to actually investigate the closest living relatives, which uh, in this case are actually at one fledgling extent and into space. And by investigating these lineages, we expect to better understand how the ethics of our animals look like, but we can actually understand how this transition to multipolarity and this transition to animal development happens uh, gradually. So, as I said, there are three main lineages. Uh, closely related to animals, the spanoflagellates, so and ichthyosaurians. Sorin. And what is cool about these species is that they have plenty of genes that once were thought to be unique to animals. And you don't need to remember anything here in specific, but for instance, you know, P53, major regulator of proliferation across all animals, you can find a couple of animals. You know, I'll ask questions such as what is the role of P53 in the cell context? There's also other uh, yeah, yeah. like a bacteria regulator of destination, but also key factors such as uh, self validity and regulated, again, integrated, all of these, asking, you know, giving us an opportunity to ask the question what was the role of these proteins in and so forth. Another thing that's cool about the species is that they can transit into immunosylic states. So if we take one of flagellates, for instance, Spinoflagellates, mainly uh, living as a single cell organism with a collar and a flagellum, they can, when you add a specific bacterial vector, become more clonal, also of the colonies, and they actually be better with different, and they have this transient multicellular uh, behavior. Now, of course, they also can be seen on the but this time um, they do it by aggregation. So you add a little proteins B, and then the cells will come together from these multicellular aggregates. So if you summarize, you know, animals are of course only given to cell reality, and um, they can do a subclinical species of organization and undergo cell type differentiation when you find multiple cells or multiple cell types to make this thing together a multiple structure. Then if you look at qualified and the series, well, they have what we call subjective multicellularity, meaning that they need a specific environment for the tube to become transient female uh, and they form what we call temporal cell types, meaning that they move from cell type A to cell type B in time. They never coexist together in the muscle structure. But as I said, today I'll be telling you more about ichthyosporins. So, what about ichthyosporins? So, ichthyosporins are basically the underdogs of animals uh, since ever. So, the first ichthyosporin was actually identified by Ernest Peckin himself in 1857. And it was a parasite of a crayfish, um, of crayfish. And actually, the name ichthyo comes from uh, the Greek ichthyo or fish, and spores for spores, because everyone thought since that they were actually just fungal spores. They look way too much like fungi if you don't have the right tools to investigate. And, you know, it took about 100 years to actually, till we, you get to 18 and sequencing, to realize that. A couple of species that were identified that ichthyosporins points are actually not fungi, but actually seems to be in the middle between animals and fungi. And now, more environmental sampling, more with the data, actually reveal that they actually represent close animal relatives. And now we're actually in a good space because we have about 10 um, full uh, genomes of ichthyosporins with multiple species that can go easily in the lab, um, a bit like I think the more of these um, and what we also realized is that they're not only fungal uh, fish products, they actually can be found also uh, free living in all sort of environments that can be marine, freshwater, um, soil. So it's not saying that I'll do it, but pretty hard to catch, right? If you catch a Pokemon, it's the same concept, they're really hard to catch. Um, 
but they're there, at least in the genomic information. Now, what got me into ictosporins is, I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, not into genomics or phylogenomics, I'm actually into cell biology. And what got me into ictosporins is the biology. So these species have really classic biology. If you, you know, if you look at the textbook cell biological processes, this is really difficult, right? You know, take a cell, most of you, a cell divides in two. These guys do a lot of different things. I'm just going to show you the movie of three different species, playing with curl Emax. Um, this species you can see from each big cell, and at one point just split into hundreds of amoeba. Um, and the big um banana thing, uh, basically grows as a banana and then splits into bananas. So it's pretty, it's pretty funky because if you want to try and model uh, at least fit, 13 banana in a banana seed, it's almost impossible, you know, in a in a physical or a mathematical way. And we can go back so you can see the last movie. It was not. Okay. No. Okay. And this is a performance. I always think now I'll stop working on it because I just don't understand how to set a look like. And um, you can see these cells really they have a huge diversity of shapes. We can move them. You can see this one splitting into four or five different different sizes. It's just, you know, the thing I'm trying to say is that this is safe to model to model organisms and we are missing also the previous of that model species. So there's a lot to learn here. There's a lot of model analysis in different um, non model systems. Since then, I decided to work on this one. So now it's been about six years, seven years. I remember seven years, I think. And you know, the strategy is pretty simple. We have the knowledge of what the animal and brain development looks like, and then we have plenty of species of each of ones that look very different. And the idea is to investigate and compare them with multiple each of one species and try to assess whether any of the processes that we can observe in each of one can reflect any specific. Um, Multiple that we can find in animal uh, early development. Today we're talking about two stories, uh, mainly about this species of white-tailed eating species. And again, don't need to remember the names by heart, but remember that I'll be first talking about this species, species A or Arctica, and then we move to species B or Pictus, the English but how can we do it? So Arctica, the name suggests. As related to the best of the Arctic Pass in the Arctic, it grows at 12 degrees. And actually, I have data now for it growing in the fridge at four. I'm trying to see whether we can grow it at zero, which would be quite funky if you think about how um, biochemical processes of cytoskeleton modeling works. There's plenty of things to investigate in terms of how these cells actually behave, even in uh, you know, extreme conditions. Now, so for my idea, it's pretty cool. It's, uh, I like it because it's uh, pretty easy to grow. You can synchronize them. They're running the whole time. They double. You can see them all on them. They grow up and they grow up into the cells. Imagine how kind of fascinating about how this process works. Um, and for the part here, we're going to be able to actually identify that so for my idea, it wasn't really called a synthetic development. Meaning that they undergo multiple rounds of nuclear duplication without cytokinesis, uh, leading to the formation of these multi nucleated uh, cells. And this happens synchronously. Every six hours, you have one nuclear until they reach around 256 uh, nuclei per cell. In a recent reprint, um, spearheaded by Kurzban, Terry Schaaf, who's supervised by Amy and Botan, and the next father, Tang Yao. We show that these nuclear divisions are actually relying on a um, microtubule organizing center that is not a cell, and it's not a stimulable body that can be fungi. It actually looks like a stimulable body, it has none of the proteins involved or known to be involved in the fungi. And um, it has this all the large shape sitting all over the place, and it organized not only uh, the microtubules, but also organized. The localization of the nuclear pores, which I think is pretty cool in how they do that. Don't mind the tunnel, but you know, we're talking about the novelly, novel sort of uh, multi organizing center that we're trying to understand better. And um, we're also using expansion microscopy, um, which I'll be happy to detail later how expansion microscopy works, but we've been investigating or using a lot of expansion microscopy to understand uh, mitosis, and we've shown that. Um, so, for a long time, it was 
some sort of fungal line. My thoughts of process with the formation of an intermediate spindle, as you can also see here um, in the cell, and it basically it splits the chromosomes apart. Um, and then this happens in, uh, while you maintain the nuclear envelope, itself, which means that these cells are now closed mitosis. Again, similar to what's known in fungi. So you need to imagine circle a bit of a nixon so it's closely related to animals, but it seems to have retained or maintained some sort of fungal behavior, at least in their mitotic uh, process. So of course, they undergo, they undergo closed mitosis, they form these multinucleated xenocytes. But one of the big questions we're interested in is how do you go from a multinucleated cell to form uh, hundreds of unique cells, right? Uh, simple question. You have a cake. I ask you to cut it in 128 piece in one shot. How do you do this? Right? It's, it's, it's not easy. At least some of you don't know how to cut the cake, maybe. Um, so we've been investigating um, this using uh, dyes. So one of the dyes we're using is FM464, which is a lipidic dye. It allows uh, to scale the numbers. I just want to emphasize that we don't have any tools of course for your normal systems. We don't have any tools, but we don't have any yet. We're working again. Um, so we need to find different ways of imaging and understanding the specific process. And one of them is, of course, using um, chemical dyes. And so we've been using um, FM464, and we've been using the movie. What we observe is that membrane body makes I mean, two things. Of course, it's a beautiful process, but but you can see the number of adenosine will occur from the outside to the inside. So they're built, and we need to actually cool these numbers with the inside of the cell. And the same thing with the multi phenomenon that's happening is they're cooling the line. All the adenosine from the same speed across, they move, this is an MPD, right? They move from outside towards the inside. In the coordinated, and I'm suggesting at least coordinating that it's a very coordinated uh, process. We, of course, are uh, also looking at actin. And what we were able to observe is that um, this process of sterilization relies on the gradual formation of uh, actinolysin uh, in the cell, which first, so this is the middle section, this is the surface view, and what you can observe is here in green is actin, staying with phalloidin in six cells, uh, and mutinite in the uh, side. And one thing I want you to observe is that all the mutinite are very beautifully organized at the cortex, so there's a Beautiful nuclear organization that relies on negativity, which we can tell you more about later. Um, and what you can see is that early on, there's almost no acting cables at the surface. These acting cables only come up later on in the process. So you first build actin nodes. These actin nodes become actin filaments. These filaments come together with the help of myosin 2, and then this allows the formation of an actomyosin network. Only if the surface is nothing here in the middle, and then this actinolysis network will pull the membranes to allow the coordinated imaginations, um, allowing the formation of this transient muscular structure um, that you know allows at least the, when I imaged this the first time, I thought of an animal embryo. Um, and then these cells will then detach from one another, uh, allowing this. So I don't have time to tell you more about this structure, but of course we're investigating this multicellular structure in terms of how the cells are maintained together um, and how it's coordinated in terms at the ultracellular level at least. Um, and it seems to rely on uh, cellular adhesive components such as catenins. Um, but just a quick summary a bit about circumolarity. So maybe some of you are going to here, but this is quite similar to what we observed in Drosophila early embryonic development. Now, I just want to emphasize that, you know, this is not the ancestral way of animal development. Drosophila is a very divergent type of animal embryonic development. And what we think of in the history of all other is actually a convergent evolution of a sort of similar developmental path. But at least I think it is dependent on the fact that multiple nuclei share the same cytoplasm. 
and you need to find a little baby in order to cut them with higher size feet if you want to have some sort of a multicellular baby. So we have some sort of development that looks like this you know, all the new multiple uh, multiply in a shared cytoplasm. They will um, basically localize, you know, organize in space at the cortex, and then you know, this um, actualizing the penicillin will become allow us to flee and we need this individually, and it uh, allows us to split out. So at the moment, we're trying to investigate Split as well as the together and the muscle structure. What are the components that allow for solarization to happen? Is there any shared mechanisms between Drosophila and um, and uh, and Spermiformer? And you know, trying to understand a bit more how a unicellular organism that is Spermiformer is able to do similar complex solarization process um, uh, compared to what you see in Drosophila. And it just, you know, as I said, it's a mix and match. Uh, so here you have to go forward. This is like, so this, you have a multiple chain behavior, but like this up enough. It doesn't have any fill, so it's uh, very in the end top, which we're interested in. And then under the most closed matrices, whereas all the animals have this uh, open mitotic strategy. And you essentials, although in Drosophila we have what we call a semi tools with ER basically protecting the nuclei. Um, from mixing in between. So as I said, if you so if you look at some form, right? You think, well, it undergoes this scientific development. So let the show the kind of general understanding of how each of forms develop. You need to do comparative studies, really, um, and I really want to emphasize the ticket. Mouse and take a Drosophila, and we can focus on these two levels, we would never find shared mechanisms in these two. They're so far, but you know, comparative biology across all animals allows us to find this um, early set or research set of um, embryonic uh, processes. That's why we started to work on other uh, just one species. Um, so, as I said, we have started to use species in a lot of pictures for us. We look into the in the systematic way. And here we're going to talk about post-structural pieces, which seems to be the most different one across all the other lectures that we're here. So Perkinsey, different species already in the sense of where it was isolated. So Perkinsey was isolated in Hawaii, which gives me a really good reason to go there to sample, of course. Um it uh, loves the heat, so it's 23 degrees, 30 degrees. Um, it hates light, so if you put it in uh, just outside, it will never grow. Even so, imaging this is pretty high. Um, and it was also free living, so never as a system, at least not isolated within a specific organ. And first thing on the dye is that we started imaging again using the same membrane dye, and I'm just showing you how it works. So, first big surprise is that. These guys undergo radial cell cleavages in a gradual manner. So you go from one cell, two cell, actually three cell stage, four cell stage, and it keeps moving forward. And can I can see here that, I mean, to me, it resembles actually somewhat a mouse embryo um, early stages. So, first big surprise this is not synesthetic development. Here we're talking about palintonic life cycle or cell cleavages, just similar to most animal embryos. Cool. If we started so here, I also started looking at the mitosis and another big surprise. This time we have a central. Um, and central is actually um, allowing for uh, an open mitotic strategy. You can see here this is I mean, we've played uh, this uh, quest with several audience. And if we show these images and we ask people what is this spindle coming from? And many people would say this is a human cell. This is not a human cell. This is just for kids in their and it's really undergoing very similar spindle architecture, uh, torque, uh, formation of um, metaphase plate. And also what is important is that there's no more uh, nuclear envelope uh, during mitosis, so we're fully into open mitotic strategy, very similar to what is observed across all animals. So again, another big surprise. So 
It's not closed mitosis, but now we're talking about open mitosis of the central. So just to really emphasize the diversity within the specific limit. So you cannot really emphasize enough. Now. At least I cannot emphasize this enough because for so long, you know, you always say fungi are doing closed mitosis and animals are doing open mitosis, and they're so far in terms of millions of years of evolution. And now within a single lineage of ichthyosporins, you have these two sort of uh, you know, behavior of mitosis, which is really important to emphasize. Cool. So the undergo mitosis, uh, open mitosis, they undergo cleavages. What we also found is that they undergo very cool symmetry breaking. I know many of you are actually interested in symmetry breaking. So at the one cell stage, what we observe is that the nucleus migrates to the cortex, which is a kind of uh, polarity, which, you know, all animals do that. You have an animal pole and a vegetal pole. I'm not going to claim there's animal and vegetal pole because people would be screaming at me, of course. So I call them A and B for now. But clearly, there's a polarity in this in the system. The nucleus, of course, divides at the cortex. And the first division happens asymmetrically with one of the two cells, actually almost 1.5 times bigger in volume than the other one. So we have a symmetrical cell division occurring already at the first cleavage, which is a key or one of the key factors that drive cell differentiation across animals or even multiple that it's not working out. And then these cells will keep dividing um, until they form this very complex multicellular structure with up to a thousand cells, um, which I hope you can appreciate, organized very nicely. Space, and we can nicely still observe sometimes these internal cavities, which resembles a nice blastula stage in animals, which again is crazy, right? These cells are not animals, and yet they organize this side plenty of morphological features that uh, early animal embryos do. So, cell cleavages, over mitosis, very complex cell organization, and to the we have cell differentiation, and to make a story short, the long story short, the answer is yes. Um, so here we've been focusing only on the late stages, um, and we're using a specific antibody against um, acetylic tubulin, which lights up flagellated cells. Um, and this is again an expansion microscopy. Um, and what you can nicely observe is that not all the cells have flagella, and actually all the flagellated cells seem to be only on one side of this cell. So we're now trying to analyze this better in space, which is not always easy when you have only spherical cell. It's difficult to have specific pointing where is the top and down in a, in a fixed sample. But what we observe repeatedly is that it's always about 15 to 20 percent of the cells that have a flagellum in the wild type condition we're using, which means that at least two cell types coexisting together in a multicellular uh, organization, which is really novelty here across animal relatives. And the second thing that we seem to really observe repeatedly is that most of the most of the flagellated cells seems to emerge only on one side of the cells, which could be defined by the first asymmetrical cell division that happens earlier. So you have some sort of you know self fate decision within this uh, system already that happens earlier. The dream is to be able to go to do you know, full lineage tracing understand but you know, it's not easy again not models of species no genetic tools yet so couple system the summary here we go back to this beautiful tree so from a separate consideration is a different deal that undergoes uh cleavages next to breaking uh subdivision how the special uh multicellular organization I see that cell differentiation and this time you know, multiple cell type coexisting together in a multicellular structure. Um, so, very similar to what is observed during animal development. If we plot this here, you can clearly see that you know, it's called for what animal do and uh, blah, blah. So, again, we're not saying that, or at least I'm not saying that chromosphere Perkinsey holds all the secrets for evolution of animal embryonic development, but Clearly, if we never investigated this species, we would not have the answer. So again, we're going into the idea of we need to investigate more and more species. And what is cool now is that in the lab we have two species, think of them as Drosophila and mouse, but this time we have Spherophoma artica and Chromosphere And we can really, you know, 
investigate what we call comparative embryology, but in non-animals, right? And we can investigate what allows them to become multicellular with you know, cell division, morphogenesis, try to understand what uh, allows the cells to be maintained together, but also cell differentiation. And the idea is that over the next years, we'll be able to answer some of these modules and how some of these modules are made across these different species to understand what is the unique feature of each, but also what are the um, shared developmental features between these two species to get a unique view of how each is going to develop, which will allow us to go back to balance and see that there's any um, parallels that can be drawn. So that's the strategy. For it is one. This is a, the main focus of the lab, but as I said, we're also interested in giving tools to other uh, to investigate other species. And one of the things that we found is that so as I mentioned this year, uh, it took me five years to get a single marketable staining in any of the ichthyosporins, um, because they have a very complex cell wall, they're very difficult to go. I mean, there's not a single antibody that goes through them. And the day I tried expansion microscopy, I realized quickly that this is the way to go because all the cells were extinct. And for those of you who don't know, expansion microscopy is a method that allows to cross-link the sample with a hydrogel. And then using water, you basically expand the sample physically up to four times. And by expanding physically the sample or the gel, uh, the sample within the gel, physically four times, you actually allow first to get the higher resolution with the cheaper microscope, but also it allows for um, antibodies and stainings to go through. So the moment I realized that ichthyosporins were solved with expansion microscopy, I thought, well, let's go for all of the non-model species that are out there that, you know, many people have left. I mean, most of these species, plankton species and non-plankton species that you've seen in the in the wild have been, someone has worked on them in the 40s and the 60s using very chemically fixed EM at the time. But everyone has dropped this since, the. I mean, the moment you have a model system, then you drop all the non-model species because you can do genetics, you can do stainings. And... I thought, and I'm not, of course, alone in this endeavor, but we have, it's a, it's a multi-lab uh, endeavor to try and just use expansion microscopy as a mean to bring, basically, or to allow for more people to work on non-model species, because now we can still use expansion microscopy. And as you can see, we are definitely not alone. This is a big endeavor between Tara, Silicon um, so plenty of things going on. I'm just going to, you know, pinpoint some of the things that are moving on right now. So first of all, this is the multi line endeavor. Uh, both of us, Simon and Yanni, are at EMBL, and I'm just sure you all know Colin Zoom here. And it started with this very crazy idea that uh, EMBL had, which I really love, which it's, it was about, I mean, you're pretty known. Does anyone know Tara Ocean or Tara expeditions some of you so tara has been i think it's there there it's been 20 years tara is this beautiful schooner that has been basically going around the globe it has a lab very tiny lab on board and it's going around the world and it's been collecting sample planktons and doing 18s metabarcoding genomics to try to understand the diversity of the species at the genomic level across the globe and so we learned a lot with uh, Tara. But what happened is that EMBL decided to do the same, but they wanted to also look at the um, coastal area. And of course, you know, you can understand the water using a boat, but you need another tool to understand what happens on land. And then they decided to make this beautiful, crazy truck, which I'm very fond of. So it's a truck that has everything on it. It has uh, high pressure freezers, cell sorters, uh, the most best confocal microscope you want. And this truck is just going all the coast of Europe and it allows us basically to go sample the field or the plankton in the field um, and just fix them in the, in the best way, fastest way. So basically from sample to the lab, it's 30 minutes to one hour, more or less. So we get really cool samples, fresh samples, where we can fix them, preserve them, try to culture them, 
and potentially reveal some uh, new uh, beautiful diversity. So we have two approaches of this, uh, what we call planning XM. So you can call it plankton, you can also call it planet. I think we'll leave it pretty much uh, for everyone's idea to, to think of it. But planning XM, we have two approaches. One is going for um, environmental samples. We just want to see the diversity, we want to image, we want to understand, you know, at the ultrastructure level, using spanchial microscopy, how the cells look like, using uh, microtubule staining, you know, protein staining, actin, all of these things, just general eukaryotic uh, markers. Um, and the other approach is that we're using benchmarks. So we're also going, so many of the places where we go to, so if you think of, we went to Roscoff, which is a huge, uh, I think the oldest marine station in the world. Roscoff has one of the biggest culture collection in the world with more than 5,000 species fixed, you know, growing basically in the, in the lab constantly. So we went there and we used the collection and we fixed as many as we could of these different species to get a benchmark of how every species looks like in expansion microscopy. And I just want to emphasize um, expansion microscopy is cheap. You can get volumes for very rapidly. Uh, you can stain for specific antibodies. So all of the work that we've been doing now, it's less than six months work and we're already, we're already, you know, I think we have more than, where's the month? We have more than 300 cells across the tree of life fixed. We are able to get cells that are dividing, cells that are uh, interacting with another. We've got multicellular species that no one thought would be multicellular. So you really learn, I mean, we're definitely exploding the number of species working in the lab, but it allows us to really reveal some new features and new biology that no one has, or at least many people have forgot or stopped working. Um, I'm not going to go too much into this. I'm going to show you some movies. So one of the one of the many plankton that you will find in the sea is, uh, is xenoflagellates, which for years it was super difficult to image, not a single antibody going through, and now we basically get 3D. Nice. So there's one specific species of xenoflagellate. You can also see microtubule in green. You can see now there's a different flagellate structure within the cell. And in the red is the panel labeling using the nitrous ester, which is a marker for proteins. And then you can also see how the chromosomes are very nicely condensed. So xenoflagellate is a very cool system because there's no histones in the sense of the histone, but these chromosomes are just beautifully packed and no one knows how. So Maybe with expansion, we can get it. Another super cool species that we uh, also find is ciliate. Ciliate, uh, many species of ciliate, but still it's a pretty cool because we have plenty of cilia, of course, and then we can get, again, in 3D. Um, come on now. So again, this is the lipidic dye, what body find, which shows us, uh, you know, let's say this is market table, and it's the first 3D volume of the mass apparatus. And I mean, many of you are fascinated by central medication, but how do you make it mouth like this? I don't know, but hopefully with our methods, it will allow people to go back and go investigate some of these species, which many of them, you know, are already grown into culture collections. You just need to, it costs 30 bucks to get that species back to your lab and just, you know, expansion microscopy, you can use inhibitors. Um, even without genetics, you can maybe learn something you know about one of the questions you're interested in. You know. So to emphasize, as you said, plenty of labs, but also plenty of uh, young researchers. Uh, Armando can tell you more about this. But I think this is really important for me because, I mean, as much as we're PIs, you know, I think what is important for me is that the new generation realized that we are and we have to all be beyond model systems. And maybe this tool is really important and, you know, all of the people involved in this are actually key to spread the word that we need to go beyond what we see. With that, let me thank my lab. So, Marie, Sandy, Maria, and Mary. We have been working on different projects um, in the lab. Uh, Gretchen and Yannick are close to my Excellent. Uh, well, very close collaborators. Actually, I'm almost uh, married with Gota. I talk to Gota more than to my wife every day. Um, but that's cool. I think, you know, we found, we found really, finding also a really good person to talk to on a daily basis, scientific wise, is really cool. 
and go to the right person. Uh, Pierre, my mentor, DPFL, funding, all the collaborators, and all of you for listening.